goblins, ghouls, spirits, witches, magic, while maybe true, can't really hurt you, right? Well, one family would beg to differ. This haunting became one of the most known in America, as well as the most documented. When the family eventually got to know the name of the spirit, it said its name was Kate. You, however, may know it by its other name, the Bell Witch of Adams, Tennessee. Hello, my name is Tish, and I am so glad that you're here. On this channel, we look at history, mysteries, tales, and stories. We are going to talk about the John Bell family and the entity that haunted them. We have to go back to the winter of 1804, when John decided with his wife to move from Halifax, North Carolina, to Tennessee. Along the Red River, they found a settlement of the same name. John purchased land and initially had about 220 acres and eventually grew to over 300 acres. He became a very successful farmer and with that success brought quite a bit of wealth. I do have to say here though that the reason his wealth was able to grow was at the expense of the slaves who were on the property and actually did the farming. John was not only a farmer though, he got a job at the local mercantile, he networked in the community, and eventually was appointed an elder at the Red River Baptist Church. Now, in a lot of these communities in the South and in Tennessee, Baptist churches were the center of family. They were the center of everything. This was a community that really was conservative, often described as pious. They believed in God, and they believed in angels but they also believed in demons and most certainly believed in the devil. Everything I can find indicates that the family pretty much settled into everyday life. Fast forward 13 years though, and that normal life dramatically changed and it brought about an entity that would not only haunt them, would haunt the slaves on the property, members of the community and affected them for generations. And if you believe the story, also was responsible for murder. There is not a complete consensus on how these hauntings started, but we're going to go over some of the most popular theories and thoughts. I was lucky enough to be able to visit what was the Bell property. Now, to be clear, the farmhouse is not the original farmhouse. However, it does have artifacts of the Bell family, and it is pretty much the scale that it was at the time. So you get a good idea of the layout. From what our tour guide said, the family sat down to dinner one night and started hearing what sounded like rocks being thrown at the living room wall. John got up to investigate and found nobody was there. Honestly, he didn't think a lot about it and figured it was the boys at the next farm playing tricks until he talked to their father and realized they were home with them and they could not have been there throwing rocks. There are a couple of other animal involved encounters that is said to have triggered the events. And these animals have a varied array of descriptions as well. There are two that are most popular though. One that it had the body of a rabbit and the head of a vicious dog with bright red glowing eyes. The more popular of these two though, are it had the body of a dog and the head of a rabbit still with the bright red glowing eyes. Our stories that slaves on the property began seeing these blue lights that seemed to be coming towards the farmhouse. They weren't fixated and would move around. They would come closer and closer to the tree line, but never quite breach the property line. Later, these would become known as dead man's candles. Yet a third rendition of the story is that the slaves and their children were subject to weird noises as well as being tripped, slapped, or pinched. One particular slave named Dean were carrying a large vicious creature similar to a dog but not a dog was stalking him and eventually attacked him. No matter how it started though, it began with some type of noise outside that eventually moved inside the farmhouse. 
The Bell family would hear knocks on the interior and exterior doors, but when they opened them, no one was there. They would hear voices in the room and either couldn't open the door or the door would fling wide open. Nobody was there. This wasn't just in the homes of the Bell family, though. Slaves on the property began talking about the same thing, in particular with doors. They would try to enter a room that should have been unlocked to find it appear to be locked. But then when it opened, there wasn't even a lock on the door or the reverse. Something that was always locked all of a sudden blew open. It was if something else had control. Wasn't long before these sounds and occurrences began to escalate, though. And in the bell house, it particularly would seem to be directed at the children. The kids would describe hearing what sounded like rats gnawing at the bottom of their bedpost and some type of animal scratching, trying to get up at the top or scratching the walls. A very disturbing one for the kids as well was the sound of someone either choking or being strangled. Again, nothing. Those sounds, though, began to turn physical. The kids would describe covers being jerked off their beds and things moved around the room. When we were there, our tour guide told us of one story where the youngest was jerked up out of bed by either what seemed to be an invisible rope or invisible hands to nearly the top of the room. Luckily, his siblings were there to rescue him before he was permanently injured or worse. Now, at this point, John Bell had to acknowledge that there was something going on with his family and his farm. And whatever it was, he needed to do something about it. But initially, he was hesitant to share it with anyone. I mean, think about it. How would sharing this affect his business, his standing in the community? And I mean, what about the church? Can you be an elder if you're being plagued by some type of spirit or demon? The reality, though, is he knew he needed help. He did open up at first a couple of people and then eventually more. And he requested that his friends, members of the clergy, some of the male members of his family come to his house in an attempt to try to entice the spirit to have a conversation. When they initially came together to bring the spirit forth, the only thing they could really hear was this really quiet sounding voice. Almost sounded like an elderly woman. He was struggling to get audible enough for someone to hear. But the voice over time increased in volume, increased in intensity, and increased in strength. And she began talking. And once she started talking, she would talk to apparently anybody that would listen. Naturally, being good Southern gentlemen, they asked where she was from. Those answers, though, were varied and none of them matched each other. In addition, they asked if they could have her name. She said that her name was Kate. Now, I say she here, but there's an important piece to know. There were other hauntings in the South that were attributed later to the Bell Witch, not only in Tennessee and Kentucky, but also in Mississippi. In the Mississippi writings in particular, this voice is described as male. For this story, since in Tennessee, it is mostly described as a she. That is what we're going to call it for now. The group implored Kate to tell them what she wanted and why she was there. Despite all the riddles that she was telling before, on this point, she was crystal clear. She was there to bring a permanent end to John Bell's life. Kate loved to talk. And by a lot of accounts, seemed to feed off the energy or fear of anyone who was listening. She would sing. She would quote scripture. She would cuss. Particularly seemed to enjoy having verbal banter and arguments with members of the clergy. And often knew the scriptures just as well or if not better than they did. The kids, though, got a lot of abuse at the hands of Kate. But none of them got it as badly as Betsy Bell. I don't know why she zeroed in on her. The only plausible thing that I found is that Betsy had had a suitor by the name of Joshua Gardner. Kate did not like this arrangement. 
and said that if Betsy were to marry Josh Gardner, she would be miserable for the rest of her life, which is interesting because Kate pretty much made Betsy miserable. She would pinch her. She would hit her. Not only were these sensations, they would leave bruises, scars, and scratches. The description of Betsy's torment was like that of electricity shocking her and going through her body. Now, while Kate was definitely cruel, there were times where she was less so. She would talk softer. She would pat her on the cheek or kiss her on the forehead, almost like a demurring strict grandmother. Again, we don't know why she zeroed in on her. We also don't know why she often relented. There was one member of the family, though, that Kate was particularly fond of, and that was the mother, Lucy Bell. Lucy would have conversations with her, but there are no accounts of abuse, verbal or otherwise. In fact, there are stories of Lucy not feeling well or being ill, and Kate would bring her acorns and berries. Now, why Lucy was spared this, there are some thoughts we'll get into when we talk about what really could have been happening, but nothing is really known concrete. Betsy's parents, of course, wanted to help their daughter and sent her to stay with a neighbor at a nearby farm. However, Kate followed. She opened doors, she made a lot of noise, and eventually whispered, you should not have come here. I can follow you anywhere. Imagine being a child and not feeling like you're safe in your own home. And then you try to go to get some relief, let alone some sleep. And the torture follows you. I'm sure she felt very hopeless. Eventually, Kate got her way. And Betsy did break up with Joshua Gardner. More about what happened to Joshua in a bit. Of the more benign but definitely annoying traits that Kate had is that she had the ability to mimic voices. She loved to mimic the voices of the family, the preachers, the slaves, the farmers, and everybody. That's going to be important as we go into talking about General Jackson, who would later become President Andrew Jackson. Just like everything with a bell witch, there are different accountings of how Andrew Jackson plays into this. One is that the story of Kate got to his ears and he decided to come to the Bell Farm to see what he could do. This would be logical because Jackson owned some land that shared a property line with Bell. So as this journey unfolds, you get a couple of different accounts. One is that back then, of course, they would have come by horse and supplies would have been pulled by a wagon. The way the story goes is that the wagon became stuck and would not move. Jackson was not known for being a soft man and in fact known for his temper and was often described as old hickory. He became frustrated with the situation to which Kate laughed and said that it was her. She wanted to make sure that they knew she was there and she told him she'd be seeing him soon and the wagon wheel started turning just as quickly as it stopped. Now there's another aspect of this that again It depends on which book you read, may or may not be quite accurate, but allegedly there was a witch doctor in the midst of Andrew Jackson's men, and he was determined that he was going to be the one that would rid the Bell family of this unseemly entity. This witch doctor saw an entity that was cackling at him and was sure that it was Kate. He raises his weapon and he takes aim, then click. Nothing happened. And Kate started laughing. Some witch hunter, right? The witch hunter then decided to take his leave and head to Nashville. There's a bit of a quandary, though, about Andrew Jackson and his involvement. When this was supposed to have happened, there are historians and books that place Jackson somewhere else. But two of John's sons did fight under Jackson in the War of 1812. In addition, Jackson owned some land that shared a property line with the Bell Farm. The route that he would have taken to return to his own home in what is now called Hermitage 
would have been a logical one to have come through that area. So it's possible that the story happened. It's just that the timing is wrong. No one really knows. Once they allegedly got to the Bell Farm, though, again, a couple renditions of the story. Initially, when Andrew Jackson got there, Kate didn't say anything. Just kind of quiet. One of his men stood up and said that the witch was scared of Andrew Jackson because Andrew Jackson had silver bullets in his gun. Now, this elicited hysterical laughter from Kate. She very proudly informed the general that not only would those silver bullets not do anything, he had a traitor in his midst. It is said that one of the men ended up literally getting kicked out of the farmhouse. And when I say kicked out, she kicked him out on his assets until he was out the door and on his horse heading towards Nashville. Kate proceeded to jump on the back of the horse and prick it with a pin every time it would slow down until he was well off of the bell farm. One quote often attributed to Jackson is that he would have rather fought 10,000 redcoats than one bell witch. And while this is a really, really cool statement, there's no really official record that it was said. And remember what I said, Kate likes to mimic voices. So it's very possible that she was the one that uttered those words, if indeed they were said. Either way, Jackson was not successful in alleviating the Bell household of the witch. As I indicated earlier, the plight of the family became news. And people came from all around, from the rest of the Tennessee and Kentucky, as well as neighboring areas. Newspapers ran the story of the haunting of the Bell family. Now, some of these people came out of curiosity. Some believed in the paranormal. Others thought that they might be able to defeat the witch or wanted to experience something. And often, they got a lot more than they bargained for. In particular, one man, he was confident that he could best the Bell witch. One of the more amusing stories of those who felt like they could best Kate was that of Mr. Frank Miles. Now, Frank Miles was not a weak and feeble man. In fact, he was very tall and very large and said to be over 300 pounds. He was also incredibly confident that he could rid the family of this plight. So he decided to come spend the night. Well, that didn't last very long because in the middle of the night, the family accounts that he woke them up screaming. They couldn't get him to calm down enough to tell them what had happened. He ran out of the farmhouse and across the farm on foot, never to speak to the bells again and never to return. Kate loved the attention of visitors. And again, as I said earlier, tended to feed off of energy and fear. To tell various stories, sing scripture, cuss, all the things we talked about earlier. But one thing that remained consistent was she said that John Bell was a bad man. Now, what she meant by bad, no one is really clear. We'll talk about some possibilities in a moment. Continue to escalate until the year 1820. The Bell Witches torture this family continued up until 1820 when John Bell began to feel ill. At first, he just talked about his throat was sore, and then later that his tongue felt strange. Condition did not improve and escalated into feeling like he was actually choking and to what seems to be seizures by the descriptions. Sadly, John Bell Sr. fell into a coma, and on December 20th of 1820, John Bell Sr. passed away. Now, of his passing, just like everything else with the Bell Witch, there's a couple of different stories. One is his family came in the morning of the 20th to found him gone. The second is that he left this mortal coil with his family by his side. Regardless of the method in which he passed, one thing that is consistent is that Kate was thrilled. She was laughing, heckling, singing, and basically claiming all kinds of credit for finally besting John Bell. Now, I have to say here, my analytical mind is a little skeptical, and the reason is because John Bell was 70 years old when he died, and in 1820, in general, males lived to 40-ish at best. So he was not a young man by any stretch of the imagination. Still, though, with everything that happened, you gotta wonder, 
It is said that on his death certificate, it is listed that the cause of his demise was by a witch. I said it is said to be because I could not find a copy of that death certificate, if it even actually existed, because a lot of times births and death were not put on paper, but instead put in family Bibles. After the passing of his father, one of his children came in the room and found a dark liquid that no one seems to know how it got there. They did have a doctor come attend to John, but the vial that he left was not the same as this one. And trigger alert, they decided to give it to the family cat. And needless to say, the cat suffered the same fate as John. So they knew that it was poison. This poison is what Kate claimed to have used to bring an end to John Bell. Even in death, though, Kate was not quite done yet. As they laid John Bell Sr. to rest, she made fun of the mourners. She laughed. She cussed. More scripture, more singing, and just basically made a circus of his funeral. She did so until the last mourner left and the last shovel of dirt was put over John Bell's coffin. And then, silence. Silence. After all of these years of torture and abuse, it was quiet. If I were this family, and I had been the recipient of Kate's tortures for years, to the point where I lost a loved one, I would be grateful for the silence, but suspicious of it. Did Kate leave? Because her deal was done? Was she just being quiet? I am sure every day, especially at first, the thought of her coming back never left their heads. I mean, Betsy had tried to go to a neighbor's house just to get some sleep and Kate followed her. Over time, though, there was nothing out of Kate, at least not for three years. And then she returned. Remember we talked about the fact that Kate loved Lucy Bell? And is said to have one time called her one of the greatest women on earth. Another member of the Bell family she was somewhat on good terms with was John Bell Jr. Or at least seemed to treat him with some level of respect. He was the one that she came back to visit three years later. And in that visit, she had a three-day conversation. And when I say three days, I mean 36 hours of non-stop talking. According to different records, she told John Bell Jr. that she had always been there before humans began, had been there the entire time, and would remain long after they were gone. In her conversation, she disclosed a lot about the past, the present, and allegedly made predictions about the future. She told John Bell Jr. she was going to take her leave of him and go to the West Indies but that she would be back in a hundred years. Now, did she really go anywhere? Well, that's up for debate. Some feel that she went to a nearby cave that's on the property. And actually, depending on the time of year, you can go visit. Others feel like she just took residence with other people and decided to haunt them for a while. We'll talk about that in a part two of this We'll talk about that in another installment of the story. With the promise to come back in 100 years, she told John Bell Jr. Told John Bell Jr. that she was going to haunt his most direct descendant. That would have put us at 1935. There are no records that I can find that someone else was haunted. But to be clear, it's a possibility that I either did not research the right place or that it was something not talked about. So who was Kate? Well, that kind of depends on who you ask. There are scientists who hypothesize that this is just some type of collective hysteria or even possibly a poisoning. Remember the vial that is said to have poisoned John Bell Sr. and the cat? Well, John Bell Jr. threw that into the fire and it is said initially the fire burned blue. According to some scientists, that could be a, a sign of arsenic poisoning which actually was fairly common. And during this time frame, arsenic became more controlled as far as its accessibility. Whether that's the case or not, again, 
it's up to everyone's interpretation. Another hypothesis about what happened was it was all the doing of Betsy's teacher, Richard Powell. Richard Powell was in love with Betsy and wanted to marry her and in fact did. He had talked her father into it saying that he could protect her. And think about it from Betsy's point of view. If she met somebody else, it's possible that Kate could return and then it could start all over again. She could risk losing someone else or worse, a new suitor would come along, hear about the case of Kate and back off anyway. At the very least, Richard Powell knew about the Bell Witch and knew about the plight of the Bell family. Joshua Gardner has also been listed as a possibility, although my personal opinion is this is the least likely one. Josh actually did very well after the breakup, and there's no indication he was ever haunted. He did become sheriff and became wealthy in his own right, and even established a railroad company with his brother and lived to be 85. But there are others that feel like maybe an indigenous person created all of the chaos, the family off the farm. Or was the spirit a buried ancestor that the boys had disturbed the grave of? Also, it could have been because of the boys' invasion of the Bell Witch Cave. The Bell Witch Cave was used by indigenous people for different kind of ceremonies as well as a place to bury their people. Other hypotheses range from maybe John Bell shortchanged someone in a land deal. Maybe it was a slave that had died on the property and coming back to get revenge possibly did it follow him from North Carolina. There's really not a lot of information about John Bell and the family before, or really the reason why they decided to make the move to Tennessee. The one person, though, is blamed most often, and is actually my favorite person in this entire story, is Kate Batts. Not only did Kate Batts share a name with the witch, she was said to be one. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we visited and took a tour. The guide there told us that Kate Batts' husband became incapacitated and Kate became in charge of his affairs. Now, she was not a meek and quiet woman. In fact, was known as being very, very confident. And in this time frame, that might not have been welcome with established gentlemen of the day. But she was a very important person due to their wealth and the contributions she made to the church. Some say that John Bell had a bad business dealing with her husband and that she put a curse on him after she died. But the problem with this theory is she actually died after John Bell. Others think that it had nothing to do with a land deal. It had nothing to do with um, any type of alleged abuse by John. There's another possibility though. According to our guide, Kate Batts is actually the aunt of Lucy Bell. Although we're not sure if Lucy knew that or not, or that Kate knew that or not, could that possibly be why she did not like John Bell and considered him to be a bad man, as did Kate? And she did do some bizarre things. For one thing, she didn't dress as conservative as the ladies of the day. When the girls made fun of her, she would steal their hairpins. And of course, they thought that she was putting a spell on them. Whether or not Kate Batts had anything to do with it or not, It's pretty apparent from things that I've read that her and John Bell were not exactly what I would call the best of friends. And remember when I said not only is this one of the most famous hauntings, it's also one of the more well-documented ones. With this particular story, we do not have to depend on just folklore and word of mouth. There are actually a lot of other people involved in publications involved. Newspapers ran the story of the Bell Witch, including the Saturday Evening Post. There are different historical records. And there are diaries and documents and various books from the family. And in a lot of ways, Kate is still with us today. She has inspired a lot of movies, TV shows, books. One in particular you may have heard of called The Blair Witch Project was loosely based on those events. Now to my personal story with the Bell Witch in Adams, Tennessee. My husband and I had the opportunity to go take a visit to Adams, Tennessee. Now, as I mentioned before, the farmhouse is not the original, but does have some artifacts. And I did hear a few people talk about the part of the wood from the original house in the in the replica of the farmhouse, although I'm not really sure on that detail. What I do know is when we went upstairs to the loft where the children would have slept, it was really, really hot and there was very little ventilation, but I was incredibly cold 
to the point of shaking and my teeth chattering. I had to abandon that part of the tour and go outside to warm up. God did find it very interesting that I was cold in a very, very hot area. The second thing that happened is we went to go explore the Bell Cave. Now, full disclosure here, I am incredibly claustrophobic. So why in the world would I go to a cave? And I was on vacation. We just decided to make a day of it. There is lighting, but it's not exactly what I would call clear. And there's a creek that runs kind of through the middle of the cave. There are some slippery rocks. The cave had three floors. And the third floor, from what the guide told us, had collapsed in the second floor some time ago. As we're going through the first floor, I noticed something kind of odd that a lot of the rocks appeared to be animals. Everything from a frog to a bird to a rabbit. Does the rabbit sound familiar? At least it appeared that way to me. My husband didn't quite agree with me, although could kind of see it. They decided to go into a more tight, closed area of the cave. That is when I decided to opt out. I told my husband to go ahead with the group. I found a rock and I was going to sit there. I did have the light that's in the cave as well as the light on my phone. Now, this part, I really can't explain. All of a sudden, water came from somewhere. I ended up looking like I had taken a shower in the middle of the day. Needless to say, I was not very happy and freezing. The guide found that interesting as well. Although, to be fair, it had rained quite a bit around that time frame. And of course, it's possible that rainwater seeped into the cave somewhere and just happened to decide that it was going to let it go on top of me as I sat on the rock. So what do I think? I really don't know. I know there's a lot that we can't explain. And I know at times certain places have a different feel and cadence and energy. I consider myself a lifelong learner. And we may very well be one document away from understanding more about this story. I'd love to know what you think, though. Please list in the comments. Was the Bell Witch actually a spirit that was haunting the Bell family and others? Or was this all a hoax put out by somebody with some type of axe to grind? Or was it even the family was the victim of some type of poisoning or illness that even extended to the slaves and the people in the community? If you've enjoyed this presentation, please consider giving it a like. And if you want more, consider subscribing to my channel. If you have any suggestions on things you'd like to see covered, also list them in the comments below. Again, my name is Tish, as in Tish in Tennessee. Thank you for taking the time to spend with me today. Good morning, good afternoon, or good night, wherever you are in the world. Take care.